Hi, my name is Grant Kramer, and I am a professor emeritus at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today, we'll be continuing with my lectures in plant physiology. This is the third lecture where we will talk about osmosis and long distance water transport. As you recall in the lecture before, we spoke about the properties of water and the principles of chemical potential which are important for understanding this lecture. So if you're not familiar with those principles, then I suggest you go back to the previous lecture. Lecture three, osmosis and long distance water transport in plants. Osmosis is the net movement of water across a membrane, either into a cell or out of a cell. And it's a process that is a type of diffusion. So what are the requirements for an osmotic system or an osmometer? First, you need two compartments that are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Pressure has to build up in one of those compartments. A plant cell is an osmometer, in fact, because it has a plasma membrane, which acts as a semi-permeable membrane. Pressure can build up inside the cell as the cell wall restricts the cell from expanding, allowing for pressure to build up. Like a plant cell, this inner tube with a tire around it continues to build up pressure as it's inflated. However, an animal cell without a cell wall, like this balloon, will continue to expand as it is inflated until it bursts. So animal cells must be osmotically regulated. Okay, to understand how water moves in a plant from cell to cell in short distances, we need to understand the water potential as we discussed in the previous lecture. The water potential is made up of a couple of components. Remember, the water potential is the free energy of water its ability to do work. It moves from high water potential to low water potential spontaneously. There are three components of the water potential. If you remember, I asked you to memorize those components. What are they? That's right. They are water's activity or concentration. They are the pressure and gravity. So we can define the water potential over short distances as the psi sub w equal to the psi sub s plus psi sub p. The psi sub s is known as the solute potential. And we can break that component down into this term psi sub s equals minus m i r t, where m is the molality of the solution in moles per kilogram, i is the ionization or activity coefficient as we defined before, r is equal to 0, 0 0.83143 kilogram megapascals per mole per kelvin, and T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin. Psi sub P is known as the pressure potential, and we measure that in megapascals. The third term that is made up of the chemical potential is insignificant over short distances, and this is gravity. We'll find that when we talk about water movement up to the top of a tall tree, that gravity does play an effect, but over short distances, it is minimal and insignificant. So let's talk about a few examples of the water potential and its components. If we start with a beaker full of pure water, then by definition, we've defined that the water potential is equal to zero. And this means that the pressure potential, since the beaker is open to the atmosphere, is zero. And the solute potential is zero because there are no solutes in the liquid. However, if we take a solution containing 0.1 molar sucrose, 
we find that the pressure potential is still equal to zero since the beaker is open to atmosphere. And the solute potential now is equal to minus 0 0.244 megapascals. So if we look at the water potential, it is equal to the pressure potential plus the solute potential, which is equal to zero minus 0 0.244 megapascals or a negative 0 0.244 megapascals. Remember that solutions will always have a negative value due to the definition of what the solute potential is. Now let's take another example. Let's take a cell that we call a flaccid cell, that is, it is lacking in turgor. It has no trigger pressure. Therefore, the pressure potential in this cell is zero megapascals. The solute potential in this case is equal to 0 0.732 megapascals, which is a good representation of an actual cell's solute potential. Therefore, the water potential in this cell is minus 0 0.732 megapascals. If we drop that cell into a solution of 0.1 molar sucrose solution, as we defined before, the water potential of that solution is minus 0 0.244 megapascals. And the cell comes into equilibrium with the solution of the beaker, it will have a water potential that is minus 0 0.244 megapascals. And since its solute potential is minus 0 0.732 megapascals, the trigger pressure is equal to the water potential minus the solute potential which is equal to 0 0.488 megapascals. That's about 4.8 bars or 4.8 atmospheres. That's a very high pressure, similar to the pressure we saw earlier in the tire when we blew up the tire on the bicycle. So we have very high pressures in plant cells, and this is, in fact, a very realistic trigger pressure within plant cells. So the cell wall is quite strong to hold that kind of pressure. So let's look at another situation. We increase the concentration of the solution in the beaker with sucrose. And let's take a regular turgid cell that we just developed in the previous solution. And we take that turgid cell, which has a water potential at minus 0 0.244 megapascals with a trigger pressure of 0.488 megapascals and a solute potential at negative 0 0.732 megapascals. And we drop that cell into a 0.3 molar sucrose solution. Now, the sucrose solution has a trigger pressure of zero megapascals, again, because the beaker is open to the atmosphere. But the solute potential is now at minus 0 0.732 megapascals. And therefore, the water potential of the sucrose solution is minus 0 0.32 megapascals. So if we drop this cell that has a water potential of minus 0 0.244 megapascals into solution, the water potential in the external solution is now lower than the water potential of the cell, and the water will spontaneously move out of the cell until it reaches equilibrium, which happens to be minus 0 0.732 megapascals. So the cell at equilibrium will have a water potential of minus 0 0.732 megapascals with a solute potential that's equal to 0 0.732 megapascals. Yes, water is moving in and out of the cells, but it does not change the solute potential significantly. So effectively, the solute potential stays the same. Therefore, the pressure potential is equal to the water potential minus the solute potential, which is equal to 0 megapascals. So one of the lessons here is that the pressure potential in a cell changes very readily
as the solute potentials change either inside or outside of a cell. And this is a key factor in how plant cells can absorb water or not absorb water. Let's look at another example. Let's say we apply pressure to the cell. By applying pressure, we squeeze out half of the water out of the cell. This results in a concentration of the solutes so that the solute potential goes from minus 0.732 megapascals to minus 1.464 megapascals. If we look at the cell in its final state, we will see then that the water potential of the cell is actually minus 0.244 megapascals in a 0.1 molar sucrose solution. But because the solute potential now is minus 1.464 megapascals, the pressure potential is equal to the water potential minus the solute potential, which is now equal to 1.22 megapascals. So that by applying pressure to a cell, in this case very artificially, we have effectively increased the turgor pressure of that cell. Okay, so now we understand the principles of the water potential and how water moves or what forces are involved in controlling the movement of water into a cell. But how does water get through a membrane? There are two principal pathways as shown in this slide here. We have a membrane with a phospholipid bilayer with proteins in it. Without proteins in it, water can still diffuse by osmosis across a membrane, simply because phospholipids are not in a rigid form, but are actually fluid and moving around. And as they move, they can flip once in a while, and occasionally a water molecule can cross across the membrane between the phospholipids as demonstrated here on the left-hand side. However, principally, water moves across a channel or a pore, which is consisting of a protein, which creates a small cavity throughout the protein, which passes completely across the membrane and allows water to pass through that channel and is known as an aquaporin or a water selective pore, specifically for water as shown here on the right-hand side of the image. Here's a cartoon of water moving through an aquaporin in a membrane. Occasionally, other molecules can move through the channel as evidenced by this yellow molecule. But most ions are prevented and move through specialized ion-selective channels. When we look at channels, we will find that molecules move through channels since they are open pores, they move through channels only passively, as we'll learn when we talk about ion transport. That is, they move down their chemical potential gradients. In this case, water is always moving through water channels or aquaporins passively down the water potential gradient. So how is water potential measured for a plant? I'm going to give you three examples of how the water potential can be measured. The first method is the tissue volume method. It's a crude method, but accurate enough that anybody can do at home and get an estimate of what the water potential of the plant is. The second method, the thermocouple psychrometer, is a highly accurate method, but requires very technically specific equipment that most scientists don't even have. And the third method, the pressure chamber, is a common method that can be used both in the laboratory and out in the field for the average farmer to measure the water potential of his or her plants. So the first method, a tissue volume method, is known as Chartikoff's method. And Chartikoff's method is an old method that's been used, and I've used it before in the laboratory. And it does work accurately. However, you need to do a number of replicates to be sure that you have good numbers. 
And secondly, because we're going to use different leaves off of the same plant, and this may vary a little bit depending on the conditions in which the plant is grown in. So what we do is we create a series of test tubes in a solution at a certain solute potential concentration. Here it's listed as 0.05 molal to start with. It has the symbol psi pi, but psi pi stands for the osmotic potential and the osmotic potential is the same thing as the solute potential. It's just an older term for it. Today we use the solute potential as a more modern term. And we make a series of solutions that have a certain osmolality or solute potential. And we go from 0.05 to 0.1 to 0.015, all the way up to 0.3. And we make two test tubes with the solutions of that solute potential. In one of the test tubes, we add a little bit of dye, not enough to change the solute potential, but to give it some color. And in this case, we're using methylene blue. Then, with its sister test tube at that particular solute potential, we add a leaf sample to the solution that is clear that does not have the dye in it. So the dye solution will never change, but the leaf sample will cause a change in the solution if its water potential is not equal to the solute potential. So what we're trying to do is identify which of these test tubes has an equal solute potential, or we can interpolate between the two test tubes where one is absorbing water from the leaf and another is losing water from the leaf. So in each case, if the solution is, has a higher water potential than the leaf, then the water will move into the leaf and out of the solution. The solution then will become more concentrated because it's lost water. And in the other case, where the leaf has a higher water potential than the solution, the solution will then take up water and it will become more dilute. So on the right-hand side, we have an example of how we identify what the water potential of that plant is based on the transport of water. So if you think carefully here now, in the left-hand example, we take a dropper where we've taken up a little bit of the solutions that had a dye in it. And we put a bubble of that in the center of the test tube, which had the leaf in it that is clear. And should the plant leaf have taken up water from the solution, then that solution will become more concentrated. And as we put the dye solution in, it will be less concentrated than the water that was in the clear solution, and the drop will float towards the surface. And the middle example is an example where at 0.2 molal, we have placed a drop in the center, and it was at exactly at equilibrium with the leaf, therefore no water was transported, and the drop diffuses uniformly around. And on the right-hand side, we have a leaf that had been placed in a 0.25 molal solution, and the drop sinks because the solution has taken up water, has become more dilute in the clear solution, and therefore the original dyed solution is more dense, and it drop sinks towards the bottom. So by using this method, we can get an approximation of what the water potential of the leaf was. In the second method to measure the water potential of a plant, we will describe an isopistic psychrometer. You place a piece of plant tissue inside of a chamber that is sealed and contains a thermocouple junction inside of it. On that thermocouple junction is a droplet of a solution of known water potential. The water potential of the plant tissue is unknown. Plant material will evaporate water 
into the air, changing the relative humidity of the air. As we know from our previous lecture, when we can measure the relative humidity of a solution, we can then define what its water potential is. If the water potential of the plant tissue is higher than the water potential of the droplet on the thermocouple, then the water vapor will move towards the droplet and condense on the thermocouple, causing an increase in temperature of the thermocouple. If the opposite occurs, that is that the water potential of the tissue is lower than the thermocouple's solution droplet, then water will evaporate off of the thermocouple, causing a cooling of the thermocouple, and that can be measured as and detected as well. In this way, we can measure what the precise water potential is of the tissue. In the right-hand figure, you can see a plot of different possible actions that occur for the water vapor on the droplet. If the water vapor on the droplet evaporates, then the solution water potential is greater than the water potential of the tissue. If the water condenses to the solution, then this indicates that the solution water potential is lower than the tissue water potential. However, in the middle, in between, if the water neither evaporates nor condenses to the droplet, then the tissue water potential matches the water potential of the solution, and the water potential of the tissue can be established. The third way to measure the water potential of a plant is with a pressure chamber. And this is a common method that can be used out in the field as well. A plant tissue is excised. In this case, we see a stem. It could just be a single leaf, but in this case, it's an example of a stem. And it's placed inside of a chamber that can be pressurized. So we see a rubber stopper at the top of the container with the petiole or branch sticking out into the atmosphere. Now, the water inside of a plant is normally under tension, as we'll soon discover. And as a result of this, the cut surface will allow the water to pull into the tissue, creating a meniscus, as we can see on the right-hand side here. So that tension is representative of the water potential in the plant, the negative water pressures in that plant, and it pulls it as far down as the strength of the tension will allow it. So the principle here is to use an equal and opposite force to pressurize the plant and pressurize that water column back up to the cut edge of the surface. The amount of pressure that we measure that it takes to bring that water column back to the cut surface is called the balancing pressure. And this is equal and opposite to the water potential of the plant. Now we can measure the solute potential of a plant sample in a similar way as we measured the water potential. That is in principle, the solute potential is equal to the water potential of a tissue when there is no turgor pressure. So one manner in which we can do that is to eliminate the turgor pressure by extracting the plant sap sample from the plant tissue that is by crushing it and filtering it and getting a small sample solution of the plant sap. And we can place this in a vapor pressure osmometer. A vapor pressure osmometer is simply a thermocouple device that can measure the vapor pressure in a chamber when there is a solution on a filter paper placed inside that chamber as we can see on the right here on a standard vapor pressure osmometer. This is also used to measure blood samples as well. In a second method, you can place a tissue inside of a psychrometer, as we discussed earlier, like the isopistic psychrometer, measure the water potential, and then stick the psychrometer inside of a freezer and freeze the tissue. This will cause ice formation, which will destroy or rupture the membranes and cause the tissue to lose all of its turgor. And we can then measure 
the solute potential of that sample in a psychrometer in the same manner as we measured the water potential before. A third method is to use a pressure chamber. With this technique, we place a sample inside the pressure chamber and we pressurize the plant till we reach its balancing pressure, which would be its relative cell volume at 1.0 on the x-axis. And we would plot a data point as to what that pressure was, and that would establish what the cell water potential or the plant water potential was. Then we would overpressurize the sample to bring out a certain level of sap out of the tissue, and we would collect and measure that volume. And we would continue to do that, and each time we would measure the amount of pressure that it took. And we would get a plot like we see in the bottom section where the water potential is declining because we are plotting the opposite of the pressure that we just measured. We'll see it declining in a curvilinear manner until at some point it becomes linear. When it's linear, this represents that the turgor pressure has disappeared from the sample and the water potential measurement is now only equal to the solute potential. If we continue this out long enough to produce and extrapolate a line from the linear portion, we can extrapolate that line all the way back to the y-axis and determine what the solute potential was of the plant without turgor. The difference between the measurements of the solute potential on the y-axis at the point at where the plant is fully hydrated and the water potential that was originally measured is a sum of the total pressure potential of that plant and thus the amount of trigger pressure that that plant had. So in this measurement, we've not only determined the solute potential, but we've also been able to measure the water potential, solute potential, and the pressure potential. Now we can measure turgor in a plant by two ways. One as a indirect method by calculating the difference, that is the pressure potential is equal to the water potential of the sample minus the solute potential, as I just described with the pressure volume curve or the freeze thawing of a thermocouple psychrometer. But there's a direct method called the pressure probe that allows us to measure the pressure directly. In the old days, we had a very crude pressure probe in which we had a huge algal cell called a nitella, which we were able to stick a glass tube into the center of the cell and measure the amount of pressure. So the pressure in the sample would push out into this sort of capillary tube and you could measure the distance along this tube to determine how much pressure was in this cell. In a more sophisticated device that's been developed since then, we have something called the pressure probe that is using a very fine microcapillary tube that can be stuck into a single cell. And the same principle occurs. There's a column of oil inside the microcapillary tube. As you stick the microcapillary tube into the cell, the pressure in the plant cell will push that oil column back from a line. And you can use a micrometer screw to tighten that column and push that oil, that silicon oil, back to the point where the sap is equal to the cell. And you can measure with a pressure sensor the amount of pressure that was applied to bring that sap back to the edge of the cell. And by that method, you can measure the pressure directly. The problem with this method is that sometimes the cells are damaged in poking them and you can't get an accurate measurement. So you have to do lots and lots of measurements in order for it to give you a good estimate. And it's been shown by John Boyer, who perfected this technique, that you can provide comparable measurements to the isopistic psychrometer, which is highly accurate. Okay, so let's summarize the lecture so far. We've learned about the water potential, which is a measure of the water status of the plant. 
we've learned that water moves passively down its water potential gradient. And we've learned how to measure the water potential and the different components of the water potential, the solute potential and the pressure potential or the turgor pressure of a plant. This gives us an idea of whether the plant can absorb water from the soil or not. If we know what the water potential of the soil is and we know what the water potential of the plant is, we will know whether water can be taken up and how easily it can be taken up. To know how fast it's gonna be taken up, we need to know something about the conductance pathway, but at least we know the direction of water movement by knowing the water potential gradient. So this might be a good time to pause in the lecture and take a break. In the next part of the lecture, we will talk about long distance water transport, the mechanisms that are needed for water to be transported up to the top of a tall tree. That brings us to long distance water transport in plants. As I mentioned before, water is vital to life on this planet and plants must absorb water in order to grow and to exist and to do photosynthesis and produce the carbon or carbohydrates that we all need to live on for our own energy sources. So in this part of the lecture, we'll consider the mechanisms that are important in water transport in a plant. So how does water move up a tall tree? In the first part of the lecture, we considered diffusion, and we realized that diffusion can only account for water movement over very short distances. So how does water move up a tall tree? There are three possibilities that we'll discuss and that have been considered by scientists. One is root pressure, the second is capillarity, and the third is the cohesion tension theory. So let's consider root pressure first. Root pressure occurs under certain circumstances in plants. As we mentioned before, most of the time, water is under tension and not under pressure. But at night, when the pores close, the plants can build up pressure inside the root system at night. And we can see evidence of this in the morning by the presence of guttation, as shown in the two corners of the slide here, where you can see water droplets on the edges of the leaf. Now these are actually guttating out of what we call hydathodes. They're sort of modified stomata at the ends of the leaves and represent a direct connection to the xylem vessels in the plant. So this occurs primarily with high humidity and high water status and is most often observed early in the morning before the stomates open up. However, it's insufficient to generate enough pressure to move water to the top of tall trees. It is a factor with smaller plants as we see in the strawberry plants on the right here. A tall redwood tree would require three megapascals of pressure. That's two megapascals to overcome the resistance in the xylem and one megapascal to overcome gravity. The highest pressures that have been observed in any plant are between 0.5 and 0.6 megapascals. So this is clearly not enough pressure to move water up to the top of a tall tree. Let's consider capillarity. Capillarity is a factor that occurs in thin tubes and the adhesion of water to the sides of that glass tube allows it to pull the water along the tube. This occurs more with thinner tubes than it does with larger tubes. The thinner tubes will pull water up the highest. The maximum height that water can move by capillarity is only 0.5 meters. So this clearly cannot account for the movement of water up a tall tree. That brings us to the cohesion tension theory. There are three elements that are important for the cohesion tension theory to be valid. One, you need a driving force. That is, there are more negative water potentials along the pathway from the soil to the top of the plant. Two, it requires a hydration force. That is, we need the water 
to be able to adhere to the cell walls by hydrogen bonding. And three, we need cohesion force, that is the mutual attraction of water molecules to each other by hydrogen bonding. This latter factor can be an important factor in what causes plants not to take up water. We have a phenomenon called cavitation. Cavitation occurs when air comes between the water molecules and breaks the hydrogen bonds, as observed here on the right, where we see some xylem vessels and some tracheids that are filled with gas and are no longer able to pull water up because it requires each water molecule to be cohesive with another water molecule to pull it up to the top of a tall tree. This happens frequently in the real world on a hot sunny day when transpiration is very high and can actually be measured by a microphone if you stick it up next to the side of a stem, for example, of a corn plant. You can literally hear the popping of the xylem vessels as air embolizes and causes cavitation in the xylem vessels. Here are the recordings of a dehydrated tomato stems that are cavitating. The popping sounds are accelerated over a one hour period. Fortunately, at night, these vessels can be refilled and the plant can survive the stress and live for another day. Let's look at the anatomy of a water transport pathway in a plant in order to understand how water is moving and is capable of moving through that plant and all the way to the top. We'll start with the soil, where there is a water potential in the soil that is needed to be addressed by the root system. There's the root with a pathway that goes through the roots, through the cells, and into the center of the plant where the xylem vessels are, and transport water up through the stem, to the leaves, and out into the atmosphere. So we're gonna examine these different components in detail. Let's start in the soil, in the area that we call the soil rhizosphere. This is an area just outside the periphery of the root, where there are soil particles, there are root cells and root hairs sticking into the water. And if we look at the water in the soil, we see that it is non-homogeneous. That is, there are air pockets in this soil, and there are layers of water that are more tightly adhering to particles, and there are layers in between that are less adhering to those soil particles. Water moves through the soil by mass flow or bulk flow, and it moves in response to a pressure gradient. As the water is moving into the plant, it pulls the water from the soil towards the root system. The rate of movement through the soil is dependent upon two factors. It's dependent on the pressure gradient and the conductivity of the soil. Sandy soils have a high hydraulic conductivity through the soil, but clay soils with very fine particles have a much lower hydraulic conductivity. So it is more difficult to pull water through a clay soil than it is a sandy soil. In addition, as the water content of the soil declines, so does the hydraulic conductivity, and it becomes harder for the plant to absorb water into the root. Contact between the surface of the root and the soil is critical or essential for effective water absorption by the root. Thus, many plants produce fine root hairs to increase the surface area for increased absorption into the plant. Now let's look at a cross section of the root and look at the structure in the root. Here we can see the movement of water from a root hair going all the way through to the center of the root where we have the xylem vessels, which are the water pipes that carry water up through the plant. This is a very important slide showing a very important anatomical structures for the ability of plants to absorb water, but also in the future we'll see to separate out ions and prevent certain ions from being taken up and allowing other ions 
to be taken up that are of importance for the plant's mineral nutrition. And there are two pathways that we're going to discuss. One is called the apoplastic pathway. And the apoplastic pathway stands for the pathway that is outside of the plasma membranes across most of the pathway. So it goes through the cell wall space. The other pathway we'll refer to is called the symplastic pathway. And this symplastic pathway means that the water crosses the plasma membrane and enters inside the cell and then moves between cells through cytoplasmic connections, as we'll see in a little bit. So let's look at the structure of the root first. We can start with the outside layer of the root, which is known as the epidermis. The inner cells just beneath the epidermis is called the cortex. And then we have a very important layer that separates the inner tissues of the roots from the outer tissues of the root. And this is known as the endodermis. And the endodermis is ringed with a layer that's drawn here in red of waxy substance called the Casparian strip. And this surrounds the cell and blocks the apoplastic pathway so that water cannot enter through to the xylem by the apoplastic pathway at this point. Once it hits this impermeable barrier, the Casparian strip, it must cross the plasma membrane and enter into the cell. It can then freely exit the cell back into the apoplast and move through the rest of the apoplastic pathway to the xylem. Now, if you recall, the xylem cells at this point are mature cells and they are dead. So there's no living cytoplasm in them. There's no plasma membrane. They're basically a cellulose structure or a cellulose pipe that is enabling the movement of water. The inner layer next to the endodermis is called the pericycle. And this is a layer of cells that is a meristematic cell that divides and produces both inner and outer tissues, particularly that of the xylem and the phloem. Notice that the xylem are colored with red circles and the phloem are colored with green circles. The phloem is another piping system that allows the movement of sugars and is a living tissue. We will discuss phloem transport in a later lecture. So I mentioned that there is a symplastic pathway and there are transports processes going on between cells. Well, these connections between the cells are known as plasmodesmata, and they have a tubular structure that goes through from one cell to the next, but they're not simply an open pipe. Here on the left is an electron micrograph through two cells with many plasmodesmata connections between them. And to the right of it in the B is a cross section through those plasmodesmata, and you can see that they're is a plasma membrane surrounding the outer edge, and there's an inner core called the desmotubule, which is in the center of the core. To the right, we have a cartoon diagram showing what that structure is in more detail. And we can see that there is a continuous connection of cytoplasm between the two cells, allowing for transport through the cytoplasm. But this desmotubule is made up of proteins that form a central rod. And they have spokes or spoke proteins that reach out to the edges of that plasma membrane. So it turns out that the plasma desmata can change shape and size. And they can close the pore with certain reactions, or they can open the pore allowing for things to flow through. So this is a much more complicated structure than originally thought as just a simple tube that went between cells. In general, I think these plasmodesmata are generally open, but plants have the ability to regulate them and to cut off flow to certain cells when it is desired. Now let's look at a longitudinal section of the apical region of the root because this is very important in terms of the root development, but also in terms of water. And later on, when we talk about ion transport, it'll be important for that. 
So we have, if we look at the very tip, the apex, we can see that there's a mucilaginous sheath around the root, which is produced by the root and helps to encourage in the rhizosphere the association with microorganisms with the root. There's a root cap on this root, which is a, several layers of cells that actually surround a area that is the root meristem, which is where the cells are dividing. These cells are very important and need protection by the root cap. Following this region of rapid cell division, there are the development of the different cell types. And again, we can see the different layers of the tissues. We have the epidermis, we have the endodermis with the Casparian strip, we have the xylem and the phloem. In the meristematic zone, they do not have these developmental traits. But by the time we get further back in the root, those cells continue to expand and they form what we call the elongation zone. And during this zone, the cells are still developing and expanding and maturing into their developmental types. At this point, that endodermis with that waxy Casparian strip is not fully developed. And water can transport to these cells without being blocked through the apoplastic pathway. But by the time we get back to the maturation zone, the endodermis is fully formed, the Casparian strip is fully formed, and this blocks the movement of water. Now this occurs just in the tip of the root. So most of the root is in the mature zone. This is where we'll see root hairs that are developing. And we'll see that the width of the root continues to expand, but the cells are no longer elongating. So the only reason that the root is expanding or getting larger is by greater numbers of layers of cells being produced. Now that we have that in mind, the, let's look at the rate of water uptake along the root. So here we have a diagram where we've measured the rate of water uptake on the y-axis across from the distance from the root tip in millimeters. So we're in 40 millimeters or four centimeters all the way up to 500. And we can see, and this, this example is actually in a corn root, we can see at the tip that there's much higher rate of water uptake than there is in the mature zone. So this is consistent with where the endodermis and the Casparian strip are fully formed. So there's also one other factor that affects water uptake as well, as eventually in the mature root, we get a suberization on the outer epidermal cells, or the ep epidermal cells are actually sloughed off with new layers forming which have a suberized tissue. So as we get up into the more mature root regions, there's less and less water being taken up. So this is an important point that new root growth with new young fresh root tips are very important for water absorption to plants. And so in the spring, when there's a flush of new root growth, this is very important for the establishment of the plant for that spring season. Water is still absorbed in the mature regions, but not nearly to the same extent as the young tissues. So in the xylem, there are several different cell types, and these influence the plant species and their ability to grow. In the gymnosperms, we have tracheids, which are narrow, long cell types that are dead, they're part of the xylem tissue that transport water. In angiosperms, we have a further development of cell types. In addition to the tracheids, they also contain xylem vessels, or as seen here, vessel elements. And there are different types, some with a perforated plate at the end of each cell, and they're connected to each other, as we see in the right-hand side, forming a tube. But clearly, with a perforated plate, there is some sort of ability to block or can be blocked along the way. Or we have some xylem vessel that have an open perforation plate. So it's a clear path for connection. In the case of tracheids, they don't have these open pathways, and water must transport laterally to the next cell. And so the water pathway is more resistant, less conductive for 
the xylem in a gymnosperm or in plants that have a large number of tracheids relative to the xylem vessels that might be in that plant. And this can be a good thing, the resistance, because that means it's less likely to lose water, but it also can reduce the rate of growth of that plant because it cannot make the water come to the plant cells that need it as quickly as it could. So here is it again an example of the connections between those xylem vessels in one plant or the tracheids in another plant. And you can see the interconnections that go on between the different cell types. So let's do a simple calculation to understand the importance of the radius or the size of these xylem vessels or tracheids. We know by the theory of water transport through pipes by the Poiseuille's equation that the rate is proportional to the radius, that is r to the fourth power. So let's take an average tracheid and its radius at 10 micrometers and compare it to the average vessel radius, which is 40 micrometers. That's a ratio of vessels to tracheid size of four. And if we put that into the equation for the proportionality for the radius, we can see that four to the fourth power, the vessels have on average a, an ability to transport 256 times more water than an average tracheid can. So that's a huge difference in ability. And one of the reasons that angiosperms have dominated the environment compared to gymnosperms, where there's adequate water availability. So once the water gets through the stem and it enters into the leaf, we have a series of pipelines or venation that go through the leaf, depending on the type of leaf. Remember, monocots have a different venation pattern than dicots do. We're looking here at what kind of leaf? Dicots, that's correct. And we can see that we have a major pathways of pipes coming in that get finer and finer, and eventually into a very fine netted venation, which brings veins close to almost every single cell in the leaf. Now let's move to the leaf. This is the critical interface for why water is transported up to the top of a tall tree. So I'm going to explain these physical principles that we've now learned and validated with much research uh, that this is in fact how water is transported to the top of a tall tree. And I'm going to give you some numbers. This is the reason that we've learned all these terms about the chemical potential and water potentials so that we can understand why this mechanism works. So if we do a cross section through the leaf up in the upper left hand corner, we see the three different cell types. We have the epidermal cells, we have the palisade cells just in a layer below, and we have the spongy mesophyll. And then we have a, a blow up of these spongy mesophyll cells. And they're called spongy mesophyll cells because there are huge pockets of airspace in between them. And so we can see that we have a cell with a cell wall and a plasma membrane and a vacuole and chloroplasts. And they're surrounded with a layer of water that has an interface with the air in the air pockets. The cohesion tension theory explains how substantial movement of water can move through plants and occur without any direct expenditure of metabolic energy. That is, there's no requirement of pumps. There have been many hypotheses put out there by scientists before that there are, there are active pumps using energy that are pumping the water up the plant. This has never been validated, and this cohesion tension theory explains how this can occur without the input of extra energy. The energy that powers the movement of water through plants comes from the sun, which by increasing the temperature of both the leaf and the surrounding air, drives the evaporation of water. So this driving force for water movement occurs in the leaves. So this gets into some of the earlier lectures here. Because cellulose 
is hydrophilic and it has a contact angle that's equal to about zero, the force resulting from the surface tension causes a negative pressure in the liquid phase. As the radius of the curvature of the air-water interface decreases, the hydrostatic pressure becomes more negative. So here we show that as water is removed from between two cellulose microfibrils here, the radius of curvature becomes smaller. And with the radius of curvature at 0 0.5 micrometers, we can have a hydrostatic pressure of minus 0 0.3 megapascals. At 0 0.05, when more water has been re removed from those cellulose microfibrils, that curvature gets even smaller. The hydrostatic pressure decreases to minus 3 megapascals. And we get to 0 0.01 micrometers, that hydrostatic pressure decreases to minus 15 megapascals. That's a very strong tension that can be used to pull the water all the way up from the roots to the top of the leaves. Now, what is it gets to the leaves and gets into the atmosphere, as recall, the water molecules can evaporate into that atmosphere. It can then diffuse around through the leaf inside that atmosphere within the leaf. So here we see a cross section through the leaf with all the different cell types. What's most important to appreciate is in this case, we have stomatal apertures or pores on the bottom side of the leaf. And this is where the water can escape outside to the atmosphere. So we look at this blue arrow here, we can see that the humidity inside the leaf is at a high water vapor pressure. That means the water will then diffuse down its concentration gradient through the stomatal pore to the atmosphere where there is a much lower water vapor concentration. And this movement of water out of the leaf then causes more water molecules in that cellulose attached water to escape from that liquid film out into the atmosphere. And each time a water molecule escapes, another one within the liquid water replaces the one that was removed. And because they have cohesion, they're all attached to each other, each water molecule is pulling another one along. And it reaches all the way down to the root system pulling up water into the plant, connected into the soil water, pulling it inside to the plant all the way up through the top of the plant and out through the leaf. So it's very important that we have adhesion occurring or the water would not continue to move. The water would just suck out. So if we had a cavitation that breaks that water column and no longer can water be pulled up to the top of a plant. So it's vital for the plant to rehydrate in the evening in order to maintain the ability to absorb water all the way up to the leaf. Another important point here in this figure is to show that as the stomatal pore opens, it also allows for CO2 to move in. And in fact, that's the main reason that stomata are built on leaves is to be a pore to allow CO2 to be entered into the leaf. Why? So that we can have photosynthesis. The caveat is that once the pore is open, water can escape. So stomata are very important in controlling the movement of gases in and out of the leaf. It wants to allow CO2 to go in, but it wants to minimize the amount of water loss. And we'll see that these stomata guard cells that are involved in the control of the pore are very important and highly regulated. We'll get to that in a moment. So let's look at um, the air temperatures and how that impacts the water content of our air, as this will control the rate of diffusion out of the leaves. So warmer air, as we know, can hold more water. And if we look at the saturation 
water vapor concentration is that is how much water can be held at 100% relative humidity. After that, we would have rainfall. So this is the maximum amount of water that air can hold. We can see at zero degrees centigrade, the maximum water concentration is 0 0.269 moles per meter cubed. And as we increase by five degrees centigrade, we can see that the concentration increases all the way up to 45 degrees, where it holds a maximum of 3.637 moles per meter cubed. So our saturation water vapor concentration goes up in a sort of logarithmic scale as diagrammed here. The rate of transpiration out of a leaf is controlled by this vapor pressure deficit that is outside the leaf relative to the inside of the leaf. And we can call or measure this rate of transpiration as a flux, that's the rate, flux refers to a rate. So it's a milligrams of water vapor leaving a square meter of leaf surface per second. And one of the factors that influence that is wind. So if we look at the stomatal ap aperture on the x-axis, that is how wide open is the stomata aperture or pore, we can see that as it increases, so does the rate of transpiration. As the pore is closed, that rate of transpiration declines. With still air, we see that in this case, we have a rate of about 70 milligrams of water vapor per square meter of leaf surface per second. But with moving air, we can have 250 milligrams of water vapor because what happens with still air is a boundary layer begins to form as the water molecules bump into each other. But with wind, it pulls those water molecules away from the surface of the leaf and it creates an even greater driving force for transpiration. That's why on windy days, your plant needs much more water or it will dry out due to the fast moving air pulling the water out of the plant. Here's a table showing the representative values for the relative humidity and the impact that relative humidity has on water movement, the absolute water vapor concentration and the water potential for four points in the pathway of water loss from a leaf. So the upper location, we have the inner air spaces, and these are occurring at 25 degrees centigrade. And we can see that the water vapor concentration is 1.27, or a relative humidity of 0 0.99. This relates to a water potential of about minus 1.38 megapascals. Just inside the stomatal pore, we can have a reduced concentration because some of the water has left the stomata. So we have a relative humidity slightly smaller at only 0 0.97, just two hundredths of a difference. And we can see that the water concentration is down 1.21 and the water potential now has dropped significantly to minus 7.04 megapascals. If we look at just outside the stomatal pore, outside the leaf, the relative humidity now has dropped to 0.47, and the concentration in the water there is 0.6. So we now have a water potential that is minus 1.037. In the bulk air, further away from the boundary layer of the leaf, we have a relative humidity that is 0.05, with a concentration of 0.05 and a water potential gradient that's minus 93.6. The important point here is to realize that it is the concentration gradient for the water vapor that is driving the movement from the inside of the leaf to the outside of the leaf. Although these water potentials are very, very negative, these are not the important factors in the gaseous phase. It is the concentration gradient that is important. Remember, there's no membrane separating these pathways. If that were the case, we would need a membrane there and those water potentials values would become important for osmosis. But in this case, 
all along this pathway through the xylem, we have not been crossing membranes. We've been moving water by a pressure gradient and the adhesive forces of water pulling the water up to the top of the leaf. So let's examine these guard cells for a moment that create these stomatal pores. On the left hand side, we see some stomatal guard cells with a pore that are surrounded by subsidiary cells that support those guard cells. They're specialized cell types in the epidermal layer. In the upper right hand corner, we can see a two guard cells forming a inner tube like structure around a pore. And in the middle figure, we can see a cross section through two guard cells of a different plant where we can actually see the space between the two guard cells that allows the air to move in and out of the leaf. So let's look at some stomatal dynamics for a moment. CO2 will enter through the open pores to allow for the leaf to perform photosynthesis. Water, on the other hand, escapes as a consequence. And it escapes at a rate 1.56 times faster than CO2 can move in due to its smaller mass. And here's an equation to show that. We can show you the velocity of water over the velocity of CO2, which is based on certain constants times one over the square root of their mass. The mass of water is 18, the mass of CO2 is 44. And you perform this calculation, you see you come up with a ratio of 1.56. So water escapes more quickly from a pore than CO2. So the plant wants to get CO2, but it doesn't want to lose its water. And it becomes very important for it to control the rate of photosynthesis and the rate of water loss, particularly when water is limiting. So stomata are highly regulated to maximize photosynthesis and minimize water loss. How do these guard cells control the stomata? Well, let's look at the structure of them first. We have two different kinds of guard cells. In the upper figure, we have a typical guard cell on a dicot, and we can see that the epidermal cells surround these guard cells, which form a pore. There are two of them, and they are kidney-shaped. And notice that they have these radially arranged cellulose microfibrils. These guard cells will expand when they take up water. We'll get into the me mechanisms of how they do that when we get into ion transport. But suffice it to say that they can absorb water, and when they do, they expand. And because of the arrangement of these cellulose microfibrils, they are tighter on the inner side and wider on the outer side. As they expand, they stretch out into this kidney shape forming a pore. Likewise, they close their pores by losing water from these cells, which then cause the cells to shrink and collapse the pore. In the bottom figure, we see a different type of stomatal complex that we see most typically in monocots like the grasses, where they form these dumbbell type shapes which they work with slightly different principles, but the same principle that as the cells absorb water, they continue to expand and create a larger pore. And as they lose water, they collapse. Here is a high resolution video of a stomate opening and then closing in response to a stimulus. This is a time-lapsed video. So it is the water uptake that causes the swelling of these cells. And the water uptake is controlled by the process we've discussed already called osmosis. And in this case, osmosis is controlled by ion uptake into the cell, which controls the solute concentration. And as we know, the solute concentration increases that lowers the solute potential 
which lowers the water potential. And with a lower water potential inside the cell relative to the outside of the cell, water will spontaneously flow into the cell. That flowing of water into the cell increases pressure, expands the cell, and opens the pore. What are the principal minerals or solutes that are involved? In most cases, in most plants, it is potassium and chloride, and sometimes it's also malate. It depends on the plant species. And these are the most important solutes that are rapidly taken up into the cell to cause this rapid flow of water movement. This is also what happens in sensitivity plants where leaves suddenly open or close or the venous flytrap. Similar mechanisms occur in certain specialized cells of the plants. The increases in solute concentrations have been observed to be as high as 0.5 molar under these circumstances. And this is enough to lower the solute potential by minus 2.0 megapascals. So these can be very rapid movements with very rapid flow of water. There are other environmental effects on stomata as well. Stomata are controlled by both light and low internal leaf CO2 concentrations. This will cause them to open up. Dark or high internal CO2 concentrations or low water potential in the leaf can cause stomatal closing. The low water potential causes an increase in a hormone, a plant hormone, a stress hormone known as ABA or abscisic acid. The increase in this abscisic acid affects the ion transport into those cells and causes stomatal closing by causing the loss of water from the guard cells. In this figure, we can see an example of this where the water stress is having an impact on the leaf water potential. So if we look at the upper figure, we can see the leaf water potential on the y-axis. And as you recall, as the plant becomes more water stress, the water potential will decline. So the water potential is dropping because the plant is not irrigated, and we're following this on the x-axis over a number of days over the course of a week. So water was withheld from the plant, and we see with time, eventually, the water potential of the plant begins to decline. At the dotted line, water is added back to the plant after day five, and we see that the water status is improved right back up high again, where we have a high water potential. Let's look at the bottom figure now. We can look at the stomatal resistance. That's the closing of the pore. So resistance is the opposite of conductance. Stomatal conductance is an open pore. Stomatal resistance is the inverse of that. And we can see at day two, the stomatal resistance is still quite low, but that the stomatal resistance increases very rapidly as the water potential of the leaf drops. And this continues to stay very high until water is provided again, and then the stomatal resistance decreases. The stomata are opening as the soil rehydrates. Associated with this, we can look at the ABA content of those leaves, and we can see that uh, in parallel to the stomatal resistance, we have an increase in ABA content, which rapidly declines when the plant is rewatered and goes back down to normal. So this was some of the first evidences that that ABA content may be regulating the stomatal conductance. And we'll learn more about that again when we talk about ion transport. Finally, let's look at an example of water potential gradients through a tall tree. So we'll start at the soil, at the bottom of the tree, and we'll see that the soil 10 millimeters from the root has a water potential of minus 0.3 megapascals with a pressure potential of about minus 0.2. This is in part controlled by the soil matrix, which I didn't get into in this particular lecture. And here it's listed as the solute 
osmotic it's called the osmotic potential here it's called the osmotic potential again this is the same term as a solute potential and this in the soil at this particular soil was 0 0.1 and gravity had no effect at this kind of distance now the soil adjacent to the root would have a slightly lower water potential of minus 0 0.5 with a slightly lower pressure potential because the matrix potential happens in a soil and because it's a little less water near the surface of the root because some of that water has been absorbed it has a greater tension so it has a lower pressure potential and the osmotic potential again of this soil is about the same as the soil 10 millimeters from the root and again gravity has little effect so that we see that the soil water potential is largely controlled by the pressure potential we get inside the cell the root cell near the root surface we can find that the water potential is minus 0 0.06 so it's a little bit lower so water is going to move from the soil into the root the pressure of the cell itself has a turgor pressure that's positive of 0 0.5 but now the cell has a much lower osmotic solute potential of minus 1.1 why because it has taken up a lot of solutes inside the cell. So the cell can control the water movement by lowering its solute potential by taking up or making more solutes inside the cell. Now we get to the root xylem in the interior of the root, which is a dead cell. So in the dead cell, it doesn't have turgor pressure and it has actually a very low osmotic or solute potential. So the pressure potential inside the cell is now a negative 0.5 and this is a result of the connection to the water column that goes all the way to the leaf so if we move up once a little bit higher we can find that the actual tension in the leaf xylem is negative 0.8 resulting in a lower leaf water potential that helps for water to move in the direction of the leaf rather than out to the soil when we get to the cells that are living in the leaf we find that the water potential is again about the same at minus 0 0.8 in this case the leaf cells have a pressure potential that is positive of 0 0.2 and a solute potential of minus 1.1 note that as we are up at the top of a tall tree gravity comes into play and we actually have an effect of gravity of 0 0.1 so this is a negative effect because we're pulling up against gravity so again this tension in the plant has to overcome this resistance due to gravity the leaf internal airspace is also in equilibrium with the cell at minus 0 0.8 megapascals but if you recall the driving force outside is very very negative with a relative humidity of 50 percent the water potential would be a negative 95.2 megapascals there's no effect of pressure osmotic potential or gravity this is simply due to the water potential of the relative humidity of the air which is based on the equation listed here of rt over vw times the natural log of the relative humidity and if you don't understand that go back to my previous lecture where these factors were defined so this is an example of how water can move up to the top of the tall tree i want to remind you though though the water potential is very very negative it is actually the concentration gradient of water moving from inside with a high relative humidity to the outside of the leaf through the stomatal pores where it's not divided by a membrane it's an open conduit a gaseous phase movement of water vapor from the inside to the outside of the leaf that connects to the liquid phase in the cellulose microfibrils on the outer side of the living cells that pulls water through the xylem through the stem all the way down to the root through the root and connected all the way to the soil solution that allows for water to move 
from the soil to the atmosphere, a, a tall tree. And there you have it. That is confirmation that the cohesion tension theory can account for the movement of water through a tall tree. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is the end of water transport. In the next lecture, I would normally be teaching mineral nutrition, but I've already created a video that's in one of my other series on viticulture. I suggest you go to the mineral nutrition video on the basics. And the next lecture then in this plant physiology series will be on ion transport. And we'll again carry over from the principles that we've learned about water potentials or chemical potentials and apply those to ion transport processes. Have a great day.